and not play the Baby Shark song again accidentally. So we talked a little bit about the CPU. We talked a little bit about the clock speed. In other words, how fast that computer runs. So now we're talking them into gigahertz. So in other words, billions of cycles a second. It's amazing how fast these things run. And so I put out here a couple of things. Normally, I hand them around. Obviously, that's not an option now. But that way, you guys can see what screws are falling out of those. So this is a typical computer motherboard with a CPU attached to it. So they're in a, in a desktop computer, they're about this size, sometimes smaller, sometimes larger. There's many different sizes. Even on your laptop, same components are there, but, but a little more miniaturized. So this has spots for, for memory that we're going to talk about. The CPU is under the fan. And the actual CPU is about the size if you hold up your finger and you look at your, your pinky nail, that's what size the CPU itself is, the processor. They're super tiny. So up here is a, a video card. That's what translates into some form of an output. And then up here, just to kind of see some different styles, these are different versions of memory that are out there. This one I talk about memory is what I'm talking about. This is volatile. Your laptops have the same style of memory. It's about half the size because they shrink everything down, but it's still got memory in it. That is, that is what we call RAM. Random access memory is volatile. In other words, as soon as we lose power, we're insulated a little bit that most of us have a laptop. And that laptop's got that built-in battery in it. But if I pull the battery out, it's dead. I lose whatever's stored in there. It's my working space. And then this is what we call solid, or the, this is a, a storage. This is a hard drive. This is a typical hard drive you're going to find in a desktop computer. This is an older model. This actually has moving parts. It's like if you've ever seen the old record players where something spins. There's actually a platter, and you can kind of see where the bearings are in there. And it spins around. And it stores data and pulls data back off of there. The latest models of storage are more like this. They're solid state. They don't have any moving parts. But they're more expensive. So I can get a drive like this, a one terabyte drive, 25, 30 bucks. The same size in a solid state drive is a couple of hundred dollars. So it's much faster, but you trade off that cost. Most laptops now, for example, are all based on solid state. If I buy a Mac, they don't even offer the option to have a spinning drive anymore. Where you see this, this style of drives are on servers. And you think, well, man, I'm spending a ton of money on servers. We have not yet got to the point where the solid state drives are as reliable long term. They will die at some point because they essentially wear out. They're like little light switches and they wear out quicker. And they're more expensive. If I need a petabyte of storage and I did it solid state, that would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I can do it very cheaply with disks like that. So there's advantages and disadvantages to both. So I encourage you at some point to kind of go up and you can look at them. I would normally just hand stuff around, and it's kind of hampering me a little bit. So if I start to try to do that, just remind me, nope, you have COVID. You can't do that. So we talked about the idea of parallel and a single processor, what the advantages to each were. So what we did not talk about yet is the idea of something called grid computing. Everybody's got a computer sitting around them. Most of the time, they're sitting idle. They're not doing anything. So there is an idea that we could take that computer and we could utilize it to process information. And so we have a couple of projects that have, over the years, been very successful about doing this worldwide. Well, now companies are saying, hey, I can do that in my company, process data on computers. So one of them you may have seen is something called folding at home. So that is looking at some biological materials, and they are trying to understand the processes. It takes huge amounts of processing power, and so they distribute it. The other one that I thought was more interesting but is coming to a close was something called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligent Life. 
And it would take radio signals that they're pulling in all over and try to process them. And they would do that over millions of computers to get that processing power. Well, here's where it's also being used in a not so great way. Hackers. If I can control a 10,000 or 100,000 computers, I have a lot of computing power, I can break passwords with that. I can do what we call distributed denial of service attacks. So that same idea we use for good can be used for bad purposes, essentially. So you're going to see that we'll talk a lot about that in security. So main memory, that's what we're talking about, those sticks of memory up there. That is our working space, what our computer has to work with for programs, for data, for computations. We typically look at it in terms of bytes, B-Y-T-E, B-Y-T-E. An individual bit isn't very useful to us. We have to put them together in a string of eight to be a byte. So you're going to see that term over and over and over again, that idea of bytes. And so if we have in our computer, we have megabytes of memory. We have, notice we have that it's a thousand squared or a million bytes. If we have a gigabyte of memory, which most people's computers now have, four to 16 gigabytes of memory, that's a number in there. Servers often have 250 to 700 or more gigabytes of RAM in them. It's not uncommon to do that. Some servers are up in the terabytes of storage as it works and processes. So that's the same numbers that we've seen before. So those prefixes stand out all the way through there. So how much memory does your computer have? Most of yours, if you look, you're going to find you have 8 megabytes. Tim's to be the most standard one I've seen with most people's computers now. If I have 4 megabytes or gigabytes of memory, I'm probably a little shy. I can't do some of the multitasking. I can't open a bunch of tabs. Some of you may have built a gaming computer and you went a little overboard and you have 16 or 32. My computer at home that I use, and again, I tend to overkill things, I have 128 gigabytes of memory on my home computer. I went a little crazy. I went a little crazy. But I also use machines here on campus that are 8 and 16. Our teacher station is 8. Most of these stations, when you look at them, they have between 8 and 16 gigabits of memory in them. Some of them have 16, that when, depending on what their age of the system, whether they have that. And we'll show you here in a little bit how to look at some of that. So there's different types of RAM. And so right now, DDR2 is old. DDR3 is still old. DDR4 is the current standard for memory, and DDR5 is coming out. So it's the latest standard. So if I go buy a computer, do I want to buy one with 2 or 4 gigabytes of RAM? I would hope not. I would hope not. I would probably buy one with 16 if I could do it. It's not that expensive anymore. Some of your new phones have 10 or 12 or 16 gigabytes of RAM operating memory in them in just a phone now. It's really, really crazy. So we call that random access memory, RAM. There is another type of memory called ROM, read-only memory. It is non-volatile. It stores things but it's also very slow. So it stores things. When you turn on your computer and it runs those black screens, if you've seen that, that is reading memory off the computer and says, these are my basic instructions of how this computer needs to operate. It doesn't have to be super fast because it's not a whole lot of it, but it's what we call non-volatile. When I unplug the computer, it doesn't disappear. So think about an alarm clock. Most of you have had one. Now we just use our phone. But when I unplugged that alarm clock, did it keep the time? No, that's that idea of RAM memory. You gotta, oh man, I gotta plug it back in. Now, some of them put a battery in it, and they would hold that for a little bit of time. Think about that like ROM. It stores that time, but that's all it does. It doesn't store all your radio stations, and it can't play the radio and anything. It's typically much smaller, and it's, it's stored in there for just kind of a permanent storage of small things. Secondary storage 
are those idea of those hard drives. And we have a lot of different types and sizes. That's where we can store things long term. So it's non-volatile. In other words, I can unplug it. Typically much greater capacity and it's cheaper per size. So if I wanted a gigabit of memory, it's going to cost me $20, $30. If I do that on a, on a hard drive, it's virtually free at this point. So if I want a terabyte of memory, I said I can buy those for 30 bucks. If you tried to buy a computer with a terabyte of memory, you're going to spend $100,000 to get that memory alone. So there's a vast price difference. There's also a performance difference. So you'll see that. So other ways we can store data. Other ways we can store data. Tapes. Ugh. Tapes? How many of you have seen a tape drive on a computer? Have you seen the old, old TV shows and they have big reels of, of tape spinning around? Maybe some of you have seen some of those in ads. Or you've seen like old NASA footage. Well, now we have them in cartridges and they're still very useful for backup, but we don't use it as a primary means. What about optical? When's the last time you guys used a CD or DVD? Frequently? Use the DVD? You've used them. But do we store data on those very often anymore? No. No. And then the most common one now is that idea of that solid state. Because they're getting cheaper, they're, they're coming down in price, we can store that data. They're very fast, very efficient, very effective, and they do present some problems for us in cybersecurity and in, and in their reliability. Three years ago, so this lab, some of the stuff in here is getting a little old. Our original, our original money we got for this lab was in 2011. About four years ago, we said, all right, We've replaced a few computers, but we need to replace some more. And so it's kind of, at this time, we need to replace everything with solid state drives. The difference, for example, in boot times is incredible. If you have an old computer that starts on a conventional hard drive, it may take it a minute or two to start. It'll take, an, okay, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Solid state drive, 10, 15 seconds, and they boot up. It's that much difference in speed. So we put all new drives in here. And at that time, that was a pretty big chunk of money to do. They had a three-year warranty. And every one of them has died at or right after that three-year warranty on the solid-state drives. The original spinning drives are still around. And they still work. So solid-states have some issues in terms of reliability. And eventually, those little switches in there wear out. And so they do something called wear leveling, and we'll talk, we can talk about all that. But it's, they're not yet, I don't think, as reliable as a spinning drive. And I know that sounds backwards. The other problem with them is when they fail, those spinning drives kind of give you a warning. They'll usually they'll make a noise, or the, there's a sensor on there. There's something called smartware and some of those things that will pop up. Solid state drives tend to just die. Boom, gone. The same way with those USB flash drives. If you've had one for very long, you'll plug it in and suddenly one day it says, hey, nothing there, right? They can do that. And it, when they die, they die very quickly and you lose that data. So at some point, I'm going to yell about backups. And if you don't have backups, you're going to be sad because at some point you're going to lose one of these guys. So other things we can use. So. We talked about CD-ROMs, DVDs, Blu-rays. For the most part, those are obsolete in terms of storage. We've even talked about trying to store data inside DNA. There's a huge potential for that. If we could store data in DNA, DNA stores almost as much data as we've created in the entire world. How can we utilize that? And we haven't quite gotten there yet. And maybe it's a little frightening that we would insert data into you as a person. So, solid state drives, again, the advantage is they have less power, they're faster, they have no moving parts, so they are less fragile, but they're not as long-term reliable. In other words, if I drop a computer that's got a spinning drive, it can actually hit and be damaged. 
doesn't happen with a solid state drive, but again, I've had a lot of issues with that long-term reliability. So they're cheap enough now to replace, but what about that data? So you gotta work, worry about that. On the enterprise side, how do I store all this data? I've got tons and tons of data. How do I store it? And so we have to figure out some new plans. Because even if I go out and buy the biggest hard drive I can buy, what's the biggest hard drive size you can buy? So let's all go to Google and try to see what the biggest hard drive, biggest single hard drive you can find is. Fifteen terabytes? Does anybody find one bigger than 15 terabytes? The 16s. There are planned to be some 20s. I don't think they're out yet. But that's one single drive. Well, as a business, I may need to store far more data than that. And so I have to have a way that I can, I can store that data, and I need to be able to aggregate multiples of those. And so the most common thing I do is either a NAS or a SAN. So they're really kind of similar, a storage area network or network attached storage. And so it has to do with how we connect them. So this idea... All of our storage connects into the network of our device, and we store it here. Some of you may actually have one at home. If you have like a MediaPlex server, you have a device that's storing data at home. So usually in your house, it's a small box. In a business, it may be a large rack of equipment and servers. We store that, and then we can access it no matter where we're at on that network. We have some storage here that's back on our server, and we do that. And as a college, we have a lot of storage over in the administration building that we can access remotely. That way that storage is, is in a different location. It's very fast storage. And the other piece we do is we typically have some form of automated backup. So in this case, they're showing a tape drive, so it's backed up. So as a business, most of the time, you don't want to store anything on an individual desktop. That's just typically bad behavior. You have these shared drives, or you have a storage system of some kind. That way, if I have to change locations in my office, some offices have even went to where when you walk in the office, you go pick your cubicle and you go to work. Well, if it's stored only on that one computer, then it presents a, a problem. So storage area attached networks and, and NASAs are a way we can do that. Well, now we have even some other options because we have this thing called the cloud. Is the cloud scary and confusing to anybody? Can anybody say, I don't understand the cloud? The cloud is really just you're storing your data on somebody else's computer. That's really all it is. So you're renting space from Amazon. You're renting space from Microsoft. You're renting space from some other company. That's all it is. Instead of you having the hardware, so Apple Cloud, you're renting space from Apple. Dropbox, you're renting space from Apple. Microsoft, which you guys now have a pretty good sized pile of data available, you're renting it from Microsoft. So it's not scary, it's not confusing. But it is different because we don't control it directly. That scares people, some people. Why would it scare you to not have control of your own data where it's at? It could be. So imagine I'm a hospital. Would I be a little bit paranoid about storing my data off on an Amazon cloud? Yeah, you might be because you lose that local control. On the other hand, on the other hand, do you think that Amazon's security team with 150, 250, how many employees they have in that security is better than your one guy working in the data center? That's very possible. So there's, so there's always trade-offs with that where we store it. 
It can also be fairly inexpensive to store data off-site for limited amounts. So my iPhone, I store my iPhone data off on iCloud. I don't have a lot that I care about off of my phone. So I don't store my music or anything else. It's just junk on the phone. I pay a whole 99 cents a month to store 50 gigabytes of storage. Well, that's not very expensive. But now if I'm a company and I'm trying to store terabytes and terabytes of data, it can get pretty expensive. It's cheaper up front. I don't have to buy the servers. I don't have to buy all that storage. But it can add up fairly quickly over time. So it's one of those you need to balance. What is cheaper? What is more, what is, what is more expensive? So for us as a college, sometimes we make that decision. We could host our own email service as an example. We could host our own email service and provide email to students. But why would we do that when Microsoft is willing to give it to us at a very discounted price? And the cost up front is much more expensive for us than that cost ongoing. And so that's part of those reasons we have to look at. We have input and output devices. So and again, we kind of looked at a few of those. We looked at, at how we can get data off onto a printer. And obviously, we don't have a printer in here because we've got some other weird things going on. Monitors, and what you see around you now, so I don't know if you guys can poke your head up here, but there is a switcher now. I can actually take one input and send it to eight different locations and pick and choose how they go there. So these TVs over here are an output device. This is eventually going to replace that one right above there, hopefully. So my hope is, if we can find some money, and of course, enrollments are interesting right now because of this COVID thing, we're going to replace these projectors, hopefully, with these all the way around. So there will actually be two of them side by side on each end. Just like you have dual screen monitors, we're going to have dual TVs on each end. Another TV there, another one there, and actually, hopefully, one there and one up behind Bailey on the other corner. Kind of make it a showpiece, have it blanket the entire room. We're going to do some interesting exhibitions with it. Those are output devices. I show data. When I talk and it comes over the speakers, that can be an output. When I send sound, when Baby Shark comes blaring out of the speakers, that's output. Input, so in here we use a lot of the mice. We use fingers, you use touch screens. So there's a lot of different ways we do that. So common ones you're going to see. One of the ones that's most common now, and we're getting more used to it, is the idea of speech recognition. How many of you have talked to Siri? How many of you have an Alexa at home? It's pretty handy, isn't it, to just say, hey, Alexa. And I'll tell you the thing, when we, we just bought a new house, one of the first things we had to do was I had to buy a new Alexa for that one up there because we're not... We're kind of doing a split household thing. My wife was like, man, I miss Alexa. I didn't realize how much I used it for just simple things like taking the grocery list. Because you can say, hey, Alexa, put milk on the shopping list. And you can create a shopping list Yep, on Amazon. So it's really kind of a handy thing to do. And we, we got a new one in there. Even for setting alarms. I'm lazy. My, my oven has a timer. But instead of doing that, I say, hey, Alexa, set a timer for 22 minutes. Yeah. Or Siri, you can do that with Siri. You can do that with Google Home. I just settled on, on, on Alexa at the house, but it's a way to get input data in there. My kids hate it because I set timers for things. Hey, Siri, set a timer for 20 minutes, and then that's all they get to play with their Nintendo Switch. And when the time's over, they... And I already set one there. So we'll see when that goes off. So you do have to be a little careful walking in and saying things. You have to be careful. So there's other ones. We have scanners. So a lot of times you can take documents and scan them in. It's a way to put input in. The one you don't see a whole lot is this idea of, of bank checks. When you get a check, and I know checks are going away, and it's kind of hard to remember what they look like. At the very bottom is a set of numbers that are recorded in magnetic ink. And the banks can scan those very quickly. So we have all different kinds of things that are out there for getting data in. Speech recognition is becoming very popular. And in fact, 
We used to teach it a little bit in class because Windows now has speech recognition built in. What we ran into is we had 32 people shoved in here all trying to use a microphone at the same time. That didn't work as well as we intended. But Microsoft has just announced that they have a new online service for transcription where they take audio and will put it onto text. And it's a premium feature. So they have the basic feature, which will work about 90% of the words. They have a new one that they're saying is 99.99%, and you pay for it by the hour, and you get, I think, five or eight hours free a month as with your Office 365 subscription, which you guys all have as, as students. So that might be the way that you write your next paper is you actually voice type it is kind of the term that's came about. So on the bottom of these, and I know we don't see checks a lot anymore. I had to write one the other day, and it took me a while to remember like what goes on what line, because I just send everything through the bank. If I can't get an electronic bill, on our, my bank account there's something called bill pay that I just the bank actually sends them a check, because I don't want to handwrite these. But on this bottom, there is magnetic ink. And you can actually buy printers that will print in that magnetic ink for that. So other things you can see, point of sale devices. That's getting data in with those scanners. Teller machines. So here's one that will drive me crazy. And if you think about it, it probably will you too in your head. Automated teller machine. So ATM stands for automated teller machine. How many times have you heard somebody say, I want to go to the ATM machine? Yeah, you guys have heard that. And so now, now every time you hear that, you're going to go, man, they're really saying they want to go to the automated teller machine machine. So think about those sometimes. In there, RFID devices are one of the newer ones we have. If you have a pet, you may have heard the term, you're going to chip your pet. And maybe some of you have a pet that is chipped. It is a small, it's about the size of a grain of rice. And it can be read by a scanner. When the scanner goes over it, it, it emits a radio wave that excites it, and it vibrates at a specific frequency. And it says, oh, yep and it pulls a very small number. That's all it does, it's a very small number. And it comes off and says, all right, this is ID tag. And then in a database somewhere is a match to that tag to Fluffy the cat. Well, why, why do I talk about this in here? Well, one of the unfortunate things about this COVID is we have a lot of conspiracy theories going around. And you may have heard, oh my goodness, if you get swabbed for COVID, they're really putting a chip in your brain, right? I have actually seen that on Facebook. Facebook is a swampland right now. Well, even if they put a chip in there, an RFID chip, it's not like the movies where they could track you. All it can do is vibrate from about this far away and pull out a, a string of numbers about 10 characters long. Where else do we see those RFID tags? So we put them in our pets. If you have a new passport, there are RFID enabled. Some of our new cards are RFID enabled. And the merchants, so Walmart would love if we could put one of those little chips on everything. And instead of having to scan every item getting checked out, you push your card up, it scans every item in your cart and says, here's your total in 10 seconds. You can actually do that. Their price has not come down enough for them to do that yet. But at some point, they're going to have that technology. Now, there's some problems with it. So what if you're wearing your Walmart jacket that you bought last week that's still got the chip in it? And you come through this line, now you've now you got to pay for your jacket again. So there's some issues with it. Touch screens are another way. When you look at your, your credit cards now, so when you look at a debit card or a credit card, almost all of them now have this little, it looks like a little chip in there. If you don't have, you probably aren't able to purchase anything. So it now is a new way that we do that. And it's, in theory, in theory, going to keep your credit cards a little safer. Do you think it's actually working? You still, people still lose them, and there's still ways around that. So there's an example of an RFID tag. So inside of this tiny little thing, this is blown up is another way we can grab data. So it's kind of like a barcode reader, about the same distance. So we have outputs. We have different types of displays. Some of these, our book is already old. 
plasma displays are no longer being built anywhere in the world. They had a really great picture for a TV, but there's nobody was able to build them in 4K. They used a lot of energy. Now, these OLEDs are probably the latest version out there. And so if you have a Samsung S20, and that screen is super bright and very colorful, and it's really got a great picture, that's an OLED screen on a, on a phone even. So I tend to not worry too much about the different types at this point. We know that everything needs to be a flat screen because they're the cheapest way to put data out onto a site. And they have come down in price. We got these 70 inch. These are not high greatest televisions ever made, but they work for what we're gonna do. We're not building a home theater and really concerned too much. We bought these through Walmart of all places. They were $648 for a 70 inch TV screen. That's crazy how cheap they have become. Crazy. A couple of years ago, that would have been three to four thousand dollars. A few years before that, it would have been this giant deep projector screen TV that weighed 500 pounds and you had to wheel around and had a crappy picture. So prices have dropped so dramatically on this kind of stuff, it's, it's crazy. There are really two different kinds of printers that we see today. So there is a laser printer and there's an inkjet printer. If you go buy the $29 printer at Walmart, it's an inkjet. It uses those little ink cartridges. They can print color really, really well. They're cheap to throw out there, but they're expensive to use. Those ink cartridges will kill you over time if you're printing a lot of documents. So we bring out laser printers. And so sitting in the back that was out here is actually a four color laser printer. It prints color pictures. It doesn't print as good of quality as photos. The inkjets are better at photos, but they're about a tenth the cost to print to them. There's also some, some other kind of odd ones we call plotters or wide format printers. So if you want to print four feet wide and banners and those kinds of things, and there's even some bigger ones now. So one of our graduates runs a service in Auburn and Nebraska City, MERS Incorporated, and they do all kinds of printing and t-shirts, and they're the ones that run the cat cave and those kinds of things. They have a printer wide enough that they print vinyl and will wrap buses and things with it. So you can get some very specialized printers and the price goes up and up and up. So laser printers are cheap, especially if you get a black and white printer. Black and white for most things in an office is really great. You can buy a $100 laser printer and print a thousand pages on it and not even blink. On an inkjet printer, you've replaced that toner cartridge or that inkjet cartridge like five times already. So there's some price differences that we look at and we think about. The latest one we have out is actually this idea of 3D printers. And these are really amazing. Has anybody seen a 3D printer in action? No, yeah. So the cheapest ones print only in little plastic. The more expensive ones, the ones we actually use in, in commercial use, can actually print with what's called centered metal. So it's not as strong as a piece of metal that's, that's carved out or hammer forged. But for a lot of parts, it's really great. Now we're also using them in chemistry and, and biology. And one of the ideas is we're going to be able to print human organs. So your heart goes bad and you need a heart replacement. You're actually able to print one out of tissue. And they've already implanted some tissues. Mostly what they've done are replacement for cartilage and for bone and they have printed them to replace them. So for example, you lost an ear, or you have a, a, an issue with a face after a crash, or a birth defect. Sometimes they've actually modeled that and printed it. The other area that I think is using it, so they're not directly usable in the body, but you go in for a very specialized heart surgery, a lot of times they actually take all these scans of your heart. So they'll do the MRIs, and they will actually try to make a model of your heart so when the surgeon goes in, they've already seen what your heart looks like in three dimensions and can practice on it. That's a great idea. That is a great idea. So speaking of surgeons, here's a, here's a weird question for you. What is the, the best way 
or the, the thing with the highest correlation of how skilled your surgeon is. Is it how many years they went to medical school? Is it where they went to medical school? What experience counts, but actually in a weird way, because what you actually want is a younger surgeon because their hands are steadier. The number one correlation between successful surgeons and the surgeries is how many hours of video games they play. There have been repeated studies of that because those video games require a lot of dexterity. And now, in a lot of cases, what's actually doing the surgery is something like a Da Vinci robot that they're controlling, almost like a Xbox. That's crazy, isn't it? So now we're saying, hey, you're going to be a doctor. You need to learn to play video games. Well, probably not that way, but there, there seems to be a great correlation between success rates and that. Now remember, correlation doesn't imply causation, but if I see my, my doctor and he's 75 years old and a surgeon and his hands are shaking like this, I'm probably going to be a little nervous. And surgeons, in fact, if you look at how much money they make, it's kind of an interesting career path. Most doctors, are, they, they make more money as they get older and older and older and then finally they retire. Surgeons go up and then drop off dramatically when they just start doing consults and things because they can no longer do some of the very intricate surgeries. All right. What other things are we talking about? So mobile computers, things we can carry around with us. Well, now every one of us has a supercomputer in our, in our pocket. These phones, wherever I threw mine, it's more, and more powerful than the computers we use to go to Mars or in the robots that have been to Mars, the, the lunar landings, far more powerful than that. They can do things that, that I can't even imagine. We can take photos with them. They've replaced and upset the market in all kinds of ways. They're marvels. They do everything really great except now make a phone call. So we get GPS. It's upset that market. We can browse websites. And if you've lost your phone, it's a pretty sad couple of days until you find it, right? Because you're so plugged into these devices. Most of us have a laptop. So the book goes into a lot of details about the difference between laptops and notebooks and ultrabooks and tablets. It's kind of a blurry edge to me. You have some small device that you can use to input data. Can I write a document on my phone? You can. I have had people turn in a five-page research paper they wrote on their phone. Can I tell they wrote it on their phone when they're done? Yeah. So the biggest advantage is a bigger screen, so you can see things better. You also generally have keyboards that are better, so they're more useful. Tablets are kind of in between. One of the most useful ones to me, and I have, a, I have one, is a computer slash tablet that the keyboard flips over. So I can use it as a tablet, so it's a little heavier. But I can also type on it. Because if you try to type a whole lot of stuff on just the screen, it gets very frustrating very, very quickly. My wife primarily now uses, she has got an a, uh, iPad Pro and has a keyboard. And for most stuff, that's what she actually uses. It's a tablet with an attached keyboard. And so that's another model. There are some downsides to this. And one of them we find out is when you're flying. Because a traditional laptop has a hinge and it stays together and you can set it on your lap and type. Well, when you have either something like a Surface or a tablet like that, you have to kind of set up the tray and form this little arrangement so it can all work. So there are times a traditional laptop is, is a better option than, for example, a tablet. But I will tell you, my wife loves her. She does presentations all over the state and, in fact, the country. And she will work for a couple of days on her iPad and not even charge it. I can't do that. My, my laptop, a couple of hours is all it's good for. So there's some interesting, interesting changes out there in the market. So our book goes through and shows you some of those. We also introduce the idea of something called a thin client, which you probably have not seen. I'm trying to hit the highlights of what you haven't seen when we start talking about these. A thin client relies on a server. If you've been here four years, or three years even, you probably remember going into the library and they had these really slow, horrible computers that you thought. And when you looked, 
there was really a tiny box about the size of a, a couple decks of cigarettes or a couple decks of cards. That was a thin client. It really ran off a server. So it had some advantages in that I can change the program on the server, and it changes for all of those. But for whatever reason, I don't know if it was because we didn't buy a, a better unit. Most companies have great success with them. It stores all the data on the server. We don't have to worry about data loss. We weren't very successful with it. They were painful to use, unfortunately. So, But a thin client you might run into in business. Desktops you see in, in most businesses, something like this. Workstation is a term you will see. So a workstation is more powerful. So what I built at my house is a workstation. It's more powerful than a typical desktop computer. You can still put it on the desk, but it's very, very powerful. So people that do AutoCAD or, or computer-aided drafting, engineering programs, those kinds of things tend to run on, on a workstation. And you can buy a workstation. So if I go into Dell and I go into their workstation line, their precision line, I can buy a $60,000 desktop. If I, if I go into the Apple side, if I go into the Mac Pro, you can spend way over 60 grand on their Mac Pro on a, on a workstation. So things like video editing are one of the things you see a lot being used for that now. Most people, it's really that idea of overkill, and they don't necessarily need that much. So we talk a lot about servers. Usually, again, I will lead everybody back to the back and show you what a couple of servers are like. I'm going to come up with a virtual way to do that, I hope. But a server is a more powerful computer used for multiple people to access it. It's able to scale, in other words, increase its capabilities. It usually has far more robust hardware. So as an example, the most common thing to fail on most desktops is what we call the power supply. That's what takes the wall current and turns it into voltage that the computer can use. Those fail pretty frequently in terms of, of reliability. A server typically will have at least two of them, and they will fail over. So if one dies, the other one automatically takes over. They will have extra fans. They will have extra, in some cases, extra memory. So if there's a memory gets detects that it has an error, it'll say, nope, we're not going to use that memory strip, and we'll fail over to another one. They have multiple, multiple, multiple hard drives. And so if one dies, because of the way we store that data, we can actually pull it, replace it, and you don't even notice that it happened. So servers are, are large scale. Next step up is mainframe. So a mainframe tends to be, if you think banks, use mainframe computers. Thousands of people are all connected to it at once. And then we have the idea of a supercomputer. These are mostly used in research. So these are very, very fast computers. It's an interesting market. They cost millions and millions and millions, and sometimes into the tens and hundreds of millions of dollars to build. They're used for things like weather research. How do we predict what weather is going to happen? They've been used for things like how do we develop atomic weapons? How do we determine what happens? Now we're using them for even processing things like social media and trying to see those relationships between people's social media posts and what's happening in the environment. They're being used right now to try to break COVID-19 and other diseases by modeling and trying to see what happens. We, look, we try to see what happens in the air for pollution, and we'll use a supercomputer to try to model what happens so that we can know what happens to the environment in Ohio based on what happens in a power plant here in Nebraska. So if the power plant that's sitting by Nebraska City has an event where they release an abnormal amount of pollution, what, oh, that's our timer. What, uh, what happens in Ohio? So how does that move and what happens in the air? So they're used for those very, very large scale. We do not have a supercomputer on our campus. I know that'll shock you. And then we have this idea of server farms. So we put things together. So think Google. Google's data center, and they actually have, weirdly, Council Bluffs is the only place they have this. There are actually two Google data centers in Council Bluffs. One's just outside, one inside of Council Bluffs. They have over a million square feet of area. 
a million square feet of, of footage. The new Facebook data center that's being built in Papillion is over a million square feet. These buildings are huge. The building is literally the size of this entire campus. And so if you drive by it on 370 Highway, the Facebook one, it is astounding how big it is. And it's being built here because we have cheap power. That's part of the reasons they're being built. They are huge. And so we'll try to find some pictures. We can't get a, a visit to them. But the best estimate, because Google doesn't like to share a lot of internal data, in Council Bluffs, they have between 500,000 and a million servers. That is a lot of equipment. And they have spent well over $2 billion developing and building those. That's almost some real money at that point. And so certainly there must be some way we can, we can get that money back. The most confusing term that we're going to see is something called a virtual server. And this is actually a trend that's happening right now. It's why I built the computer I have at my house to play with. It's this idea of virtual. So no longer do I have one hardware device and one operating system. So think about your computer if you had 10 versions of Windows 10 running all at the same time. So now instead of when I need services, I don't, I don't go out and buy a physical server. I've already bought my physical server. I run an additional copy of, of Windows on it or whatever operating system I'm using. So we'll talk a lot about virtual. You'll see it in here quite a bit. And we'll actually experiment with it a little bit. So here's this idea of that virtual server. There's something called a hypervisor. And then that controls all these virtual servers. So instead of having physical hardware, now we have virtual hardware. So we go from 100 servers to 20 or 30 servers. So we can cut down that a lot in our storage. So data centers, again, that Google, that idea, they tend to be very modular. And they build them in specific areas. So they want areas that don't have a lot of earthquakes. They don't want hurricanes, because that can certainly interrupt. So our area is pretty ripe for the idea of data centers. They're starting to build them all over here. We have super cheap power compared to the coast. It's reliable. We don't tend to have hurricanes. We don't have a lot of earthquakes. Terrorism is a little less impactful here. We hope. Now, the more data centers and things we build that are critical infrastructure, do you think we're in more danger of terrorism? Yeah, so we always have to, to worry about that. And in fact, off at Air Force Base, do you think that's a, an area that terrorists would love to take down, since that controls our nuclear capabilities for the country? Yeah. We also are at the Center for Communications. And in some tabletop exercises, just because of the field I came out of before I came here, we identified how easy it would be to take down the nation's infrastructure in terms of communications. If you want to take out communications, you're going to shut down things like the stock market. Is that going to be an impactful event? And so in some tabletop exercises, we predicted that if I could cut fiber lines in 27 locations across the country, we could take out most of the communications in the country. We could take down the internet. Could it be rebuilt? Probably. But what we looked at were what we called single points of failure. In other words, where all the networks converged. So one of them, as an example, hopefully I'm not breaking any contracts that I've signed, is in Florida. What's, what's the problem with Florida from a, from a communication standpoint? Hurricanes. But think about the shape of Florida. It's very natural to have only a couple of communication areas coming in. And so crossing the St. John's River is a communications pipeline that nearly every carrier goes into to cross that river. If I cut that, I cut down 20 of the most common carriers in the United States. Ooh. And it would be hard to immediately try to find a replacement for it. Well, now I've cut off Florida from the rest of the world. Would that be a, a disadvantage? And if you've been to Florida, maybe you go, well, probably not. But we want to think about those in terms of security. So we'll talk a lot about that. Green computing. 
I hope most of you do not want to pollute the environment. So now we're looking at how do we make things less hazardous? How do we include recycling? So it's a problem we have at our college and we haven't come up with a really great way to deal with it. How do I recycle this equipment? And so most of the time it just ends up getting thrown away. I would hope that we start moving towards a recycling plan that's much better than what we have currently. A lot of companies lease equipment. So in other words, we lease a server or we lease a desktop for three years. At the end of three years, it goes back to Dell or it goes back to HP. And they reabsorb that and hopefully dispose of it properly. In other words, recycle as much of that as possible. We don't do that. But I think what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to build those costs of recycling into the front end. Because if I said, well, it's going to be 50 bucks to recycle your computer, where's it going to end up? It's going to end up in a trash dumpster somewhere and get thrown away. But if we build it into the front end where then they say, hey, no, bring it in here. It's free. We've already paid for it. So that's just my own personal, how do we save the world a little bit there. Really quickly, I want to talk about software. So that's the things that you interact with. And there's basically two types. System software, so your Windows operating system, utilities, those kinds of things. The software that your computer came with tends to be that. Application software is software that does something for you. Microsoft Word, GarageBand. If you edit videos, whatever video editing software, TikTok software, those things are all that idea of a application specific software. So what I have, I'll skip that. So system software, pretty common, you've seen it. You have Windows 10 usually, or in the case of a Mac, you've got a Mac OS X. That's that set of things that comes with it. So we're not too worried about that. At some point you have it, you need to upgrade it. But it acts as the application layer. So the hardware and all the things that make it run all the way up to where you interact with it are all part of that operating system. So it, it can determine how that printer that you've hooked up works. It deals with the software you install. So when you go install Microsoft Office, it interacts with with Windows 10 or it interacts with Mac OS X to make all those things happen. At the very heart of an operating system is something called the kernel. So whether it's a Mac, whether it's Linux, whether it's Windows, there's something called a kernel. Whether it's your phone, there is a kernel in there. That is the, the tiniest piece in the middle that controls all the other activities. This is the part that if we have issues with, we have the biggest problem. So updating those kernels becomes very important. So this is a list of all the things, and you'll find it. It interacts with memory, networking, or system resources, files. All of those things are part of our operating system. So there's a couple of ways, and we're going to interact in a few ways as you see it. So one of the things we have to to look at is GUI, graphical user interface. That's what we're mostly used to. But we're also going to get something called a command line, and we're going to introduce you to that. There's a lot of power in that command line, so I don't just have to point and click. I can run batch scripts and do automated tasks. And so we're going to introduce you to that idea of what a command line is. So this is a list of the current or one of the list of the most current ones. Some of this is changing as we speak. Some of that has gone away. Already, HP Web OS, gone. But Windows is still there. Mac's still there. Linux there. Google, Android, and Chrome are still there. On your phone, Apple iOS and Android are both there. So this is kind of a list of what software is out there and available. All right. To give you some time to start on this, I have an assignment here. So the first thing I need you to do is make sure you have went to week two and put in where your computer is so I can track everybody. So just that number in there. I have lectures from last week and this week all in here. 
There are these review questions. These are for your own use. This is a graded assignment, even though it says it's a practice. Putting principles into practice. This is the crossword puzzle. And again, you may or may not be able to get that one to function. It seems to be very intermittent. It should help you with terminology if you can get it. So flashcards are here. You can use those for terminology. This is just the PowerPoints, a version of them, similar to what I looked at, so you can look at those. These are some clips, open source software, operating system, software, server, cloud computing, Moore's Law. So those are all things that we have in there as videos that you can watch. This is just the learning objective. So if you want to go and see what we should look at, it's in there. And then all the way down at the bottom is an assignment that will be due by Sunday. So that is this Unit 1 Case Studies. So when I click on it, let me open it up here, see where it pops into a new window. So the Unit 1 Case Study, and I'll click Start Assignment. So this is a case about BMW. Does anybody want to drive a BMW? Does anybody want to have to pay for the maintenance on a BMW? No. They are a only buy it as a release it car. So there is a study here that you need to read, and then there are a set of critical thinking questions. If for some reason you do not yet have Cengage, email me and I will just copy and paste this to you, and you could submit it. We'll, we'll set up an alternative way you can submit this assignment. This needs to be your own work and your own words. So we're talking about the benefits of connected car technologies. So you may have a newer vehicle that's got all kinds of connected technologies. You may recognize some of those. But this is a case study we're going to do, and, I, and I'm going to give you about the next 15 minutes to at least get a head start on it or to work on those videos that are in there. All right, so for next week, we are going to finish up chapter two. There's just a smidgen left, and I've got the test actually we'll try to deploy next week. So something interesting, say yay for Cengage. Cengage in this class, what they want to do is actually now sell a testing service. I'm not going to buy that. So I've got to revise the test that I used to go through Cengage, and now I'm just going to create them and put them in Blackboard, those weekly quizzes. So. Is anybody going to be really sad if we don't have a week one and week two quiz? No. <laughs> that was the most enthusiasm I've seen all day out of somebody. So we're going to eliminate those for the first couple weeks, and I will, I will put that in then and try to. But it's been kind of a crazy start to the semester, if you haven't noticed. So I, I apologize for that. And I did not realize some of the things that Cengage has been doing. It's very handy that they don't tell us that. The problem is, there's really only two major manufacturer textbooks. They were supposed to merge. Cengage was supposed to actually merge. That has been put on hold, so I don't know the status, but it's a little crazy. What I do know is textbook manufacturers want to get as much of your money as possible. That's why I was hopeful the Cengage now at least cuts that cost down, especially if you're taking multiple classes. But textbooks are, are not cheap. And I have actually heard of over in the... Um, science area that there are three to four hundred dollar textbook in some of the upper division science courses and not just here but at other universities and institutions we could ask your sister what her textbook costs were this year and she probably would have a panic attack so unfortunately it's not something we can control very easily all right any questions all right so this is your assignment the rest of those things make sure you've went through and watched those videos Look at things because they're, they give you a take that I can't just give you telling you in person. You can actually see what a data center and some of those other things look like. So because we can't shoot as much show and tell, I'm going to try to grab videos from outside sources also and put in there. So you'll see some of those starting to appear as, as I find them and start using them. All right, any questions? Any comments? Anybody ready for the world to be normal again?
Yeah. All right. Thank you guys for hanging in there. Make sure you've done the attendance if you're on campus in a seat. That way we know who's here and who's where. All right. Thank you guys. Let me hit the end recording button.